thanks everyone for being in the audience today. Um, and uh, if you are at all interested or you think it's relevant, we can talk a bit more about research um, afterwards. But um, <coughs> perhaps if it's all right, I, um, I'll just give this presentation as a bit of a set piece, um, as, a, as a standalone narrative, and just hopefully just let the story wash over and um, take questions at the end. It's just over the horizon, even if you look hard, you still can't see it. Off this beach, close to the Northern Territory community of Wire, is one of the most important industrial developments for Australia's top end. About 110 kilometers offshore stands the Black Tech Gas drilling platform, a facility owned and operated by the Italian-based energy multinational Ente Nazionale Idrocaburi, or ENR. The platform is a giant, with steel legs stretching deep to the ocean floor below. It extracts natural gas from the Timor Sea, which is pumped to an onshore processing plant, and then onwards into a vast pipeline network. This gas has become the main fuel source for the NT's electricity generation, and with contracts extending to 25 years, its supply will be an integral part of the NT economy for years to come. It should also generate hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue for e and I. There is one remarkable aspect of the black tip well. The facility is entirely robotic. Humans seldom visit. It's the same for the onshore pipeline. The infrastructure is monitored from a computer control room in Darwin. At the processing plant, human staff numbers are minimal. The system is designed as an automaton, with human intervention only required for monitoring, system maintenance, and contingencies. It is a showcase of modern industrial achievement, a technologically advanced efficient entity within which human input has been rationalized to a minimum. Only a few kilometers away from the processing plant is Water, a seeding, marginalized, mainly indigenous community with almost 3,000 residents. It has remained almost entirely redundant to the Black Tip project. There are many ways we can try and understand the situation of how places like Water and Black Tip can coexist. And it goes to the heart of many conversations and debates that would be familiar to anyone living here in the Northern Territory. One interpretation fits into a development narrative, a conventional story um, that dominates government and media as an example of economic development and employment opportunities where it's needed most. And policy, public policy, needs to support these sorts of business projects. Another narrative is that this is a case of exploitation where natural resources on indigenous lands are extracted, leaving legacies of ecological damage with little lasting benefit to local communities. Hi, here's one. It's nice coming to the territory of the ocean. <laughs> so it's easy to complacently fall into sides of this debate and not really question our positions too much. But I wanted to disrupt these easy narratives that rely on economic tropes of exchange and production and exploitation, and instead interpret the situation using the embodied metaphor of the cyborg. I'm using the strange creature of the cyborg as a way to think about our current age, this historically unique period of the 21st century in which global networks of commerce and business and technology have inextricably penetrated each of our life worlds. Uh, in which privileges of connectivity and information pulse along with social and ecological marginalization. So here, the cyborg is more than a blended creature of human and machine, of labor and capital combined. It's also about a way of knowing, a name for our modern rationality. It represents the body colonized by the computer. The computer here is not just a physical device of metals, plastics, and microchips, but an agent noun the being who computes an order of information processing. Its infiltration represents a modern transformation of thinking, working, consuming, living. And as I'll focus on here, redundancy and prosthetic replacement, re-innovation and growth, has become a necessary part of its rationality. So this is not a moral argument against E&I or the Black Tip Gas Project. Instead, I want to highlight the normalcy of the project, morally and operationally. 
compared to BP, Gazprom, or PetroChina, or other big energy players, e and is not a particularly large player in the, in the energy industry. It operates legally and makes much of its social and environmental investments. But as for the north, the modern day energy industry, operations are capital intensive. Of course costs need to be streamlined. Of course labor inputs into production are minimized. This is not malicious design, but something more matter of fact and morally agnostic. And is Blacktech even an e really an E&I project? Another consortium owns and manages the pipeline. Many other co contractors have been involved, especially in the construction. It is a network. Well, even E&I, like most large companies, is not even really a thing or a standalone entity, but more of a dispersed assemblage. Giving it a national identity by calling it an Italian company is quite misleading. It's a publicly, publicly listed corporation bound to its global financial interests, legally coded, guided by business management rationalities. Investors residing in Italy dominate its share portfolio, but there are shareholders from every corner of the globe. For example, the People's Bank of China has a significant holding in it. So it's somewhat absurd to describe E&I as something with strict spatial or human boundaries. This corporation, and the modern corporation in general, is the quintessential cyborg being. And to describe the Black Tick project as rapacious, exploitative of capitalism, perhaps misses its nuances and ambiguities, too. While their residents, after all, could not be totally ignored during its development, because ENI's processing plants uh, and the, the pipeline were on indigenous owned land, the company needed to come to an agreement with the custodians. And the Northern Land Council negotiated hard on their behalf. Water itself also attracts its uh, share of national attention as a site of indigenous disadvantage and extremists, an embarrassing blemish on Australia's prosperous complexion. It's the sort of place where government ministers fly in to announce new reforms to close the gap and where bureaucracies trial innovative policy solutions. The town also receives intermittent media coverage whenever indigenous equality comes back into focus. The visible poverty, and unemployment, and housing overcrowding make good copy. Waters gangs of jobless degenerate youth, grouped according to heavy metal band names such as the Jews' priests, evil warriors, or more recently, the Fear Factory and the German boys, have also been favored curios and targets of remediation. In this setting, E and I had to supply something to water residents. Its community investment strategy in corporate parlance. It was important that the company appear generous. The big initiative, of course, was um, it was employment. During Black Tip's construction phase from 2007 to 2009, a big show was made of the local vocational training program and plenty of high visibility, high vis working was handed out. However, few participants went on to find, on, uh, find employment with e &I. Most work was contracted and subcontracted out to niche engineering firms, and the workforce was flexible and fleeting. When construction ended, almost all the jobs went anyway, and nobody made a fuss because redundancy was expected. Instead, the corporation relied on the conventional methods of uh, community development or community investment, royalty payments, and short-term grant funding. Some traditional landowners now receive ongoing royalty payments, as negotiated through uh, the NLC. Grants reached a peak in 2008 at the height of the construction phase. E and I reported community investments totaling 312,000 euros that funded environmental health projects an annual water festival, the Murnpata Language Center, and the local rangers program. In 2008, a school class was even awarded a week-long trip to Italy. Most visibly, funding was given to the local AFL competition. What motivates these handouts? Corporate goodwill, PR, contractual obligations, facility security? On the AFL NT website, the grants to the free program were just justified in surprisingly blunt terms. It stated, the primary objectives of e &I's support of AFLNT's activities in water is mitigation of the risk that the Black Tip project causes significant increases in vandalism and theft, leading, leading to rises in negative youth engagement with the police and justice system. 
In any case, corporate solicitude has since shifted its gaze. The Black Debt Project's workforce is now virtually non-existent. The community grants have dried up. The AFL sponsorship has gone. The project still generates tens of millions of dollars a year in revenue. However, at a local level, it has become nearly invisible. When I started visiting Water in 2007, construction on the project had already begun. As much as I could, I followed the development with interest. Yet it remains somewhat of a sideshow, seen by most as vaguely beneficial. This contrasted with the arena of government policy at the time. First, an unpopular local government reform was being pushed through, and the local council was being amalgamated into the Victoria Daily Shire Council. This was my professional reason to be in water. But this reform was soon blindsided by even more unpopular Northern Territory intervention, and then more reforms to CDP, a community employment and training program tailored for Indigenous communities. A running objective in all these reforms was the market-based transformation of local economies and the ensuing behavioral changes required of individuals. For example, the anti-minister responsible for the, the 2008 Shire's amalgamation describes the Shires as, quote, a regional economic development model that would promote mining and horticultural opportunities. Around the same time, then Indigenous Affairs Minister Mal Groff lament, lamented the lack of a real economy in places like water. And he stated that in an environment where there is no natural social order of production and distribution, grog, pornography, and gambling often fill the void. A viable economy and real job prospects make education meaningful point to a life beyond abuse and despair. Currently, there are too few jobs in these communities, and land tenure arrangements work against developing a real economy. In 2009, a government evaluation of CEP refocused the program goals on real jobs and viable business enterprises, and concluded that, quote, CEP can best assist labor market adjustment when it is focused on the labor market, rather than internally on supporting the local community. An influential review of Indigenous employment programs penned by mining magnate Andrew Tweedy Forrest in 2014 stated, we must use the power of the market and business incentives to deliver the jobs to, to eliminate disparity. And the eminent white paper on developing Northern Australia, released in 2015, called for a quote, a more flexible labor market system in the North that will allow businesses to bargain over wages and conditions specific to their business needs and will remove disincentives to work inheriting the welfare system. The running theme in all these policy pronouncements is the instillment of a more market-oriented, automated way of thinking, of a cyborg logic, as I've been calling it. And government plays a crucial educational role in this age in helping us imagine how the market functions. Of course you should find a real job, buy things, lease your land, become a better citizen, produce and consume for the market. Land tenure reform, the promotion of anything market-oriented, and above all, behavioral change are therefore the easy policy prescriptions. This focus on individual behavior allows larger structural issues, how the body of the cyborg actually lives, to disappear from view. As e and I, Australia's external relations and communications manager confidently stated in a published article in 2008, the people and organizations that live and work in a region are responsible for the social and economic development of that region as part of that community. Some contributions can be made by resource developers. However, it is up to the people themselves, the individuals and the families in the community to choose and then pursue their individual and collective identity destiny. Others cannot do it for them. So there is a mission for policy implied in this too. If the targets of remediation can't act responsibly and aren't able to compute a rational solution for the joblessness, this provides a solid justification for more government intervention via education, training, welfare reform, tenancy policing, and so forth. The goal is to improve the processing of information to make them better computers, better cyborgs. The glaring absurdity in a situation, of the situation in water is that this salvation rests on a glossy myth. Water has a real economy, but it just doesn't function like it's imagined to. Even a very large 
real lucrative large-scale developments such as the United Black project close by, the private sector labor market has been totally incapable of providing enough real jobs to one as residents, regardless of the work readiness behavior. So the age of a cyborg contains its own forces of marginalization. Its subjects are drawn into a cyborg existence. Their behaviors are melded into more adaptable alloys. They are told they are responsible for their own prosperity. Yet their offering of human mind and body to the machine can easily be made redundant. There is no concerted effort in government departments or corporate boardrooms to really change this because well, we're to start. To oppose local redundancy too much would be an attack on the intrinsic qualities of an innovative technology driven economy. In this context, redundancy can be its own form of productivity as long as it's acquiescent to redundancy. The Black Tip Project may not have created any lasting local jobs, but if there's a good food comp to distract, and enough settling cash and royalties to get by, is this not its own form of success for you and I? Because of my professional work in WIRE, I was swept up in this policy agenda. Did I fully comprehend the situation or the setting I was in? I claim no special insights or expertise over people in place for my time there. Admittedly, some outsiders I met did integrate well learned the, the Murnan Pata language, and had become family with local clans. Notwithstanding morally competitive claims to the contrary, they were in my mind a very small minority, and they didn't include me. I met some very decent, friendly people in Wire, but I remained a stranger, a familiar passerby. Uh, my time had become redundant there, and some would come soon enough. And I'll hazard my experience was similar to most other outsiders. Inspired by good intentions, adventure, or opportunity, there are plenty of reasons uh, for people like me, and perhaps you, to find ourselves passing through a water. There are roads to maintain, housing, rubbish collection, a health clinic, a school, a swimming pool to manage, maybe even a research study to undertake. Each of these tasks function as a dense transfer point of sideboard power relations. The outside helper will likely have a local workforce to build capacity with, to train up. Local jobs for local people may be a key motivating mantra. But whatever language one's role is cloaked in, manager, supervisor, facilitator, it is most often the outsider who occupies a higher position in the workplace hierarchy and has more control over the material resources for the task at hand. The scene for the transmission of cyborg logic around work is set. So people like me, and perhaps you, can become crucial in keeping this logic going, even with the best of intentions. For me, the ethos of hard work, one of the dominant logics of the sideboard, was instilled by my parents, my schooling, my former workplaces, long before I found my way to water. In an odd historical continuum, my family's work history is intertwined with the Northern Territory. The ashes of both my maternal grandparents are scattered in Ireland in a place called Macassan Beach. These are ties that bind. Yet our family history lacks romantic provenance and instead has been part of a thinner, uglier history of Northern Australia's machine times. In the 1960s, my parents coincidentally converged in Mulboy, deep in East Ireland, in the site of a huge Nabalco bauxite mine. My mother, escaping convention and high school matriculation, had followed her other family members north from South Australia. She found work doing office admin for the mining company. She's the popular looking woman in the <laughs> uh, My dad's journey to the mine had been longer. He was born poor, but even worse, he was born in a German city in 1943, the wrong place at a very bad time. He survived it, and in his 20s, he escaped abroad in search of adventure and class mobility. Like many other Europeans with blue-collar trades, he easily found work in the remote corners of Australia. At the Nabalco mine in Illinois, he fixed big machines. For both of them, I learned to work hard, work hard, and work hard. From the stories I've heard over the years, years daily life for our itinerant workers in those early days at the mine were filled with long working hours, heat, fishing trips, and lots of grog. This is a picture of my dad in the mine's mess hall. Um, probably get drunk. 
interaction with the local indigenous population seemed peripheral and fleeting. One lingering memory of contact was the bulldozing of a sacred banyan tree during the mine's construction. The tree was associated with the Wuyong ancestral spirit. Its killing was sacrilege to the local Yongu people and provoked deep anger. But amongst the mine workers, the incident seemed to gain the status of a dirty joke. As it went, the driver of the bulldozer that killed the Wuyong tree is our family friend, someone I've broken bread with, also a German. The last time I met him, I mentioned the killing of the tree in passing. I silently wondered, was it a case of wanton violence, an act of creative destruction, calculated orders from the boss, or just a miscalculated movement of the machine? I never did ask him these questions, though. For what purpose? To invent a singular answer to this act of the bulldozer? Perhaps these ambivalent memories made my time in Hawaii seem more poignant, or perhaps uglier. I'm not sure. In any case, it was hard to overlook uh, the ugly signs of discontent and dislocation in that place. It's not really the said thing in polite circles, but I didn't find the town that pleasant to live in or pleasant to visit. It's a rough place. Things got trashed regularly, and bodies too. Many people seemed to just hang around, making their own trouble. There used to be a social club in town where people could go to drink and let off some steam. But in water, there was a lot of steam to be let off. Things got out of hand until one day, local teetotalers commandeered a bulldozer, drove through the club's wall, and ransacked it. The social club was long gone when I was there, but another one at the community of Pepper Minardi, 80 kilometers away, had taken over its role. That's the Port Keats Road, the main uh, dirt road to Dawn and with Pepper Minardi along the way, was littered with the wrecks of drunken vehicle accidents, the twisted metals of cars and beer cans, its own form of cyborg destruction. As I understood it, joining a gang in the setting was just another thing to do. Media and government reports tend to portray Netwater's gang culture as a juvenile delinquency issue to be contained or an almost quaint reinvention of traditional groupings. But this othering mollifies the unhinged rebellion at work, the guns smoking, flogging cars, rioting, violence, weapons <coughs> with police, and also the irreverent survival. And the gang symbology lacks any reverence for tribal but for traditional tribal totems. Instead, it reinvented cyborg imagery, heavy metal guitars, piston-pumping machines, the modern antichrist, steel phoenixes. Going for a walk one day with my dog, I discovered graffiti by the evil warriors, one of the main gangs. At the center of the tag was a swastika. The sight jolted me into my own family's own past. What was the symbol of the Nazi war machine doing here of all places? Whatever meaning was given to it, cyborg anger seemed lurking. We don't wait for time. Time can wait for us. This comment was made by a former neighbor of mine when I visited Water more recently. The statement challenged my own internalized cyborg logic. He viewed the local waves of policy reforms and developing projects not as urgent and necessary, but fleeting and unstable. He was also reminded that one day there will be an end to the e and i to project and its infrastructure. Once cyborg intervention ends, the trees, ants, and monsoon rains will slowly wreak their own creative destruction on the pipeline. Eventually, a cyclone, an earthquake, or rust will sever the legs of the platform well, and it will sink it will also become redundant. This will not occur within a time frame measured by annual financial statements or glossy paid strategic plans. In the shortest time, it will occur. Or perhaps a form of defective cyborg agency could bring a quicker, more dramatic end to the project. Don Haraway talked about the potential for changing the rules of the game. A bulldozer, a human operator, maybe a lit cigarette would suffice. It seems unlikely the web of royalties, community grants, and support for the AFL team have all kept things stable. The constant presence of police and the existence of Darwin's jail only a short plane ride away compel rough obedience. Yet in a very improbable case of sabotage, 
of a chain reaction explosion of the whole structure, I wonder how the event will be remembered as a despicable uh, crime against prosperity or as a dangerous, creatively destructive twist in the age of cyber. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Yeah, the, the pipeline, the pipeline controller, or, or I mean the processing. Oh, plant. the processing plant. Oh, yes, yes, sure, sure. Yeah. So but yes, you're right. The pipeline control room is certainly based in Darwin because that's yeah. done by APA. Yeah. yeah. Yes, um, I, I guess I just struggled with the cyborg reference. Yeah, sure. And I guess um, I mean to try to uh, I guess uh, rebut that a little bit. Um, it's only so much I suppose I could try to do in probably next half an hour to to talk through that. And it's one thing I've been challenged on too. It's like well. If you really want to make this imagery or this metaphor work, you have to pull through. I guess one of the focuses of my thesis too is very not just on this slapdash. Okay, here's one specific period of history and one industrial development, but how does this tie in with the, the early pastoral times, the early times of settlement of coming? You know, well, a focus I use in my written work is look at similar situation of this sedentary movements and settlements and how that tied in with government policy too and how those lasting effects keep going over generations and why are definitely definitely is a reflection of that too. So these these conflicts, no, it's not about this industrial development at all. Um, so that's yeah, and I'll, you know, I do try to reflect that in the writing, but it's a point I'll take away too that's um, but maybe it, maybe it, you know, it is an interesting point, given that you've just raised that uh, this has a long history, the interfe the involvement that, that different people have had over the years. Yeah. yeah. Apologies to all, but us white fellas, the involvement we've had over the years, or tried to fix, not the necessarily is our problem. I'm getting into areas that are fraught with difficulties, but maybe coming at it from a completely different angle is one way, a new way. I just, yeah, yeah I couldn't join them together. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and just, well, just to pick up on that, I mean, I guess this is partly what I'm trying to do is, is reflect on my own time there and using that as, I guess, a bit of a vessel for others perhaps like others in the room who engage in places like this too, of yeah, offering a, a different sort of critical insight to it. So a little bit of an unsettling or destabilizing way of looking at our own work in these sorts of places too. Um, with all the best intentions, I'm sure that too. Um, to just to pick up on one, one other point too, you said about say E and I's involvement and yes there has been good intentions by E and I to get involved with contracts and we're going and all the rest of it too. Um, yes, and I do want to, a lot of these companies do operate like this as well too. So I did mean it seriously, it wasn't like this moral dig at, oh look, they just couldn't do it better. I guess for me, it's more looking at, well, when a company is doing just fine, is doing all the right things, what do we still have? You know, we still have this highly automated, modern economic system that we take for granted. This, it is almost entirely robotic. It's making people a lot of wealth, a lot of money, um, and there's inequalities um, in how that works. Um, so using the side work is, is what I'm trying to do to, I suppose, challenge or bring a metaphor to understand how that works, too. Um, look, I mean, it's, I, Doing a lot of other writing on MacArthur River Mine. I think that's another example too. And again, you look at the website and listen to the PR. Yeah, they're doing great things. The territory for more of them. Um, I think there's much more critical ways of looking at how big industrial developments like that are actually impacting on the local level um, that we can challenge. I, I don't. I think there's structural issues with how someone like you and I, or someone like a project like that, functions. So I guess that's what I'm trying to leaving it open ended. I think I'm very interested in what you had to say, but I'm also having trouble joining the dots a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, because one of the issues, and I think MacArthur River Mine is a completely different case study. Yeah. Um, they have clearly had a lot of social, physical, economic impacts. But 
um, and I have some familiarity with what area, and clearly I agree with the, the multitude of changes in local government and government. But one of the issues with uh, big developments is, you know, the boomtown syndrome, where a big development comes along, changes the economic and social structure of a place, uh, and then, as you pointed out, gets the end of construction. So sometimes it's better if those impacts are actually quarantined. I think one of the issues that government keeps making mistakes about is promising thousands of jobs or hundreds of jobs from all these developments in remote communities, whereas what really suits a small community is small. You know, the things, that's what Tamara is doing quite effectively. It's the small things that aren't tied to a market economy are more um, and John Altman's work um, has, covers this a lot. It's more, uh, well, Rolf Gerritsen talks a lot about the difference between a deficits model and playing to where people are strong. So I'm um, having trouble working out really what you and I had to do with that. Um, having seen well, government departments in action in Wadi, yeah. and I think the constant change is dreadful yeah. um, and not very empowering, but I'm not sure. Sometimes it's better if a big company like EMI doesn't come along and disturb that social fabric. Yeah. Well, I guess that's part of my point too, is they didn't have much to do with it. Yeah. Um, so you can have these two-track quite disparate ways that come to work. And then somehow a place like, well, you know, John Altman's a great experience, who's been a very good interloper to yeah. for me for my work too on this paper itself. Yeah. Um, well, and then Scambry's written a lot about similar issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and just I suppose how things get separated too, but you know, like John gets a lot of flack for not really engaging with the real economy too, you know, this hybrid economy model is getting bashed by policymakers all the time as well. Um, and yeah, this, uh, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to highlight, there are patterns for, uh, you know, big projects like this sort of just operating screen around the outside. But sometimes that's not a bad thing. Perhaps not. Yeah. But but I do take the point you're talking about the corporate social responsibility as well. But maybe that's better directed to things that actually develop a community rather than disturb it. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sharing myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly the point I'm trying to make here, but. Um, uh, you're <laughs> you, uh, I'm trying to develop as I talk, but you got what it, with its um, uh, yes, a, a black tip is a, is a sort of fairly major intervention, but it, it was fairly separate as interventions go compared with things like uh, um, what happened in, in the Millenmore region or um, up in um, or other places like that, where um, you, you had much more ongoing uh, impact on the communities. And then, then you've got other communities like, um, like uh, Man Greed or so, where you know, pretty much similar in size, but no particular big um, project around Man Greed. Eh? So you, you, you've got different sorts of communities in relation to uh, big projects um, uh, interacting with them. And, um, and yet if you ask yourself, well, broadly taking into account that each one's got its own special little history and so forth, uh, what's the differences and similarities between these? And I'd say there's more broad similarities and differences really. I, the projects really haven't haven't had a hugely different impact on the communities. I mean, well, to me, it doesn't seem that the man reader say is hugely better off than than um, Arakan, um, uh, um, for the fact that he hasn't had a big project, a big um, invasive project, let's call it, uh, and and what is. Yeah, maybe halfway between them, or not. Um, so, yeah, big projects come and go and they have, have their impact, but uh, they're perhaps not the real cause of the 
of the huge uh, things that we see um, in affecting uh, what's going on in the community. Um, so that, that's one comment. But the other comment is that, uh, well, I'm not really sure about the actual sidewalk analogy. If by that it broadly means some sort of, sort of almost um, uh, being like thing that influences people's lives in a way that they can't interact with, all of these communities, I suggest, are suffering that sort of thing. But it, it's not specifically big pro project -ish. It's mm -hmm. engaging with uh, the rest of society, the rest of um, humanity. Uh, it's a continuation of colonisation. Yeah, yeah, broadly. Well, I mean, you can call it colonisation, but it's just what is. Uh, you know, they're alive, we're alive, um, uh, and they're very, very different sorts of lives. And so there's differences, and um, and these differences in in this in our society have developed into um, extremely powerful, persuasive, uh, automated. Uh, uh, information-based um, control systems and delivery systems um, and that's quite the opposite to to what the uh, well the full, uh, I'll call it broad Aboriginal culture really is and in fact was before and still is and will be for some time to come. So I don't know what that, how it relates to you in terms of what you're saying but uh, so yeah the big projects are not necessarily uh, the evil sidewalks, maybe, or, but they're just a symptom of them. Um, and, uh, and the fact that they have bigger or, uh, or have different sorts of impacts is more to do with the way these projects have changed over time. Uh, um, and that they're becoming uh, more and more automated, less and less immediately invasive um, just as, as time goes on the projects now or that have been developed now like inputs I know it's not directly impacting on a community but they're hugely more automated and, uh, and yeah. what is sophisticated if you want but uh, information based than it's even on the jobs yeah it, it, even than the the other um, LG plant just developed uh, a decade ago, you know, just a different thing. So, well, yeah, the, <laughs> the separate beasts, mm -hmm. controlling beasts, which never, which never had any control, stops. Yeah, um, well, to, um, just to try to respond to a couple of, yeah, I guess one thing I'll try to pick up a bit more on in the, the longer chapter, on the longer article on this is um, the first point you made about, like, the big interest, like the, inch, um, I guess the impact of the big industrial development. Um, and locally, I think it's one thing that stresses, it's not, I don't want to portray, I, mean, it's, I guess maybe a dark and maybe sort of presentation, but that's not, there's a lot of ambiguities in that too. Yeah. There's a lot of local interests that support these big sort of projects and do quite well out of them too. Thanks very much, Johnny. Gallery of you. Um, there's lots of other players around, and players in the water too, who wholeheartedly support the pipeline movement too. And it's, um, you know, and it, in some way, it has brought some wealth, um, you know, localized wealth to those areas as well too. Um, so definitely ambiguities in all that too. Um, you know, they are generating some sort of material benefit. Um, so yeah, I hope. Perhaps that's just gotten a little bit lost in sort of dark focus. Um, the other point, I guess, about this evil cyborg sort of existence or thing that that where you know interaction becomes impossible. Um, I guess I sort of wasn't trying to go with that um, in the writing, and and I guess one of the, how I'm using this is more positive, you know, not like this evil creature too, but also. Well, as a way of just understanding our existence is in a different way. Yeah. That we are totally, totally wed in with technology and machines in our daily lives. And and I think that's one way of perhaps breaking down the differences. Um, so the different I mean one thing of 
trumpeting and the writing is perhaps there are more similarities between you know the water vocal who's on the dole and in a work ready program versus the construction worker who is made redundant after 12 months on the pipeline too and then went to work for Impex and is now laid off again too. And is, you know, there's patterns of redundancy and growth and innovation that affect all of us in different ways. You know, there's inequality that's there still, but there's perhaps similarities. And um, and I guess uh, I'm trying to use the cyborg as an image to look at social possibilities beyond these sorts of projects. Because I don't you know, technology is not going away, and our relationship with technology is not going away. But I don't want to, I suppose, try to be too deterministic or nihilistic with the future possibilities of that too. So, and Donna Haraway is this theorist who likes water and summer, and she's very, she's quite positive, quite a humanist sort of take on it. So perhaps that wasn't reflected very well. I'd like to think about the concept. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. If I extend the comment, uh, could you clarify if this cyborg um, phenomenon or issue uh, is more is specific to the uh, what's the specifics to relate to the Aboriginal community as opposed to other um, cultural communities? Yeah. Um, I suppose what I was trying to do with it too is not so much portrayed as specific to this community, but more specific to a historical age. So it's sort of a way of understanding um, where we're up to, really, in, in, in global history in some ways, you could say. It's sort of a way of unpacking global capitalism and how that works and the differences, perhaps, in how systems were working 100 years ago. and and taking this sort of like fringe, marginalized example of a community like Wire that perhaps could be portrayed as outside the modern age or just being non-modernized, I'm trying to work against that and say, well, no, actually, these are very much, they all, you know, there's, there's much of a cyborg existence or cyborg sociality going on in there as anywhere else. Um, so I guess I'm trying to bring in the commonalities through that. Yeah, sure. Uh, but he sought to can extend it further into uh, uh, information control. Uh, uh, yeah, control of decision making through yeah. control over information. Well, and really, in really subtle ways, like how many, well, you know, using your phone to find yeah. your way so somewhere and pick out a place to For go. instance, if it had been happening in something like uh, for instance, a uh, suburb uh, in Sydney, yeah. Yeah. what would you be adding compared to that situation in Dubai? Um, well, I guess, you know, it, maybe you would look for an interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but that's just, I mean, I would hope, I think you could really apply it in all sorts of settings that sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the reason I picked this out is just because of the juxtaposition, you know, like the, the real, um, yeah, the conflictual sort of rubbing of um, uh, this high tech project next to sort of quite you know, socially marginalized um, yeah. community too. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it, there's some really interesting work that could be done in a suburb of Sydney, mm -hmm. for example, or in all sorts of different social spaces. Um, so, yeah. I wouldn't limit it. My, my question relates to your cyborg um, metaphor as well. Um, I'm partial to sci-fi sci movies. Yeah, and, same uh, here. I'm not sure what cyborg is, but I think <laughs> since you are using it as a metaphor, I'm wondering whether or not that is a common, well-accepted um, concept of a cyborg. Mm -hmm. And so that it is easier you know, for, for, for me, yeah. as you're presenting your, 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 your findings or your stories and all your data to be confident of what you are saying. So I'm wondering yeah. whether you yeah. have um, you have conceptualized or you have um, um, defined it. Yeah. Because you know you did mention that at the start of the, the project 
there were probably more people than, than, than mechanical, mechanical parts. And then, towards the, whereas towards the end of the project, you know, the machines and the, me the, 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 the mechanical parts out, outnumber the, the humans. So, is there, is, is, is the definition of a cyborg, the concept of a cyborg, you know, constant, fixed, or, or, or in, in this case of yours, because you are relating to this, uh, to this scenario, to this case, yeah. you have to, you have to actually, um, you know, uh, relate the, the metaphor to a, to a developing uh, cyborg rather than a constant uh, fixed uh, 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 entity. Yeah, sure. So um, I suppose some of us might be wondering, you know, as you're, you're moving, which which part of this relate to the to the cyborg? Yeah, and, sure. And to which part of the cyborg? Because yeah, the, the machine and the man and, and who is winning over who, who or, or just working in harmony uh, for good or for bad. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that might help um, help me understand the. Sure. Yeah. Since you're using the cyborg as, in this presentation at least, uh, as one half, if not the, the major component of your the presentation. Yeah. yeah, well, it's a very good question, a very challenging question for me. Um, and firstly, I guess part of what I was trying to do was make it not so closed and fixed. And because, and again, I'll try to write a little bit about this, but say, trying to explain it more like tropes of production, um, you know, about say, like market forces or exploitation or these sorts of words that we use and give meaning to so much that each of us in this room probably have a different idea of what the market is. So we're already totally invested in the meanings attached to it. So I purposely chose this very strange, unsettling metaphor of the cyborg because of its strangeness and because it sort of displaces a fixed meaning or people bringing their own fixed definitions to it. So I'm not trying to, you know, slip my way out of this answer. Um, but so that that's my starting point for bringing in this metaphor. But yes, I do try to, I guess, um, define it. Uh, it more, and again, perhaps it was too brief in this presentation, I do want to go beyond the sci-fi image of like, you know, the robotic arm on the human and that sort of thing, and um, start thinking about it in terms of, of thinking of like the computer, but thinking of the compu computational logics that we adapt um, or adopt, sorry, through machine age or the modern age. So d different ways of thinking um, that are perhaps the way like our rationalities are shaped by the machine or by the human and the machine blend more and more today too. So computers being, well, there's a, there's a very good, um, quite an interesting book by a guy named Philip Morofsky who talks a lot about this. So he's on about the cyborg as, or economics as a cyborg science. That's the name of the book. And very much moves away from this whole idea of the blending of human and machine. And he says, now forget about that. It's all about the computer. So the cyborg is the computer as a way of understanding the ontology, the epistemology of modern, not even humans, but this blended, mutated, techno human that we all are. Um, and perhaps in more ways than we really acknowledge there's infiltrations into the way we think and compute information um, that are tied to our modern technological age. So that's where I guess I'm trying to go with the cyborg injuries um, and not get too sci fi. Um, yeah. But, but then again, you know, we live in sort of a bit of a funny sci fi age too, in many ways. You know, so I guess to try and catch up with what's going on technologically. With our social workers. Um, I'll just speak in defence of the cyborg. <laughs> 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 She's sort of a magic actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think that, and this has been picked up by people, it's possibly the metaphor is a tad essentializing, like it, it connotes things um, that, um, you yeah, know, they have a particular meaning and it's a perhaps a little bit absolute, and some of the nuances, complexities, and entanglements um, that do exist aren't necessarily picked up by the metaphor, unless you do further work to explain the complexities. 
But I, talking about the Black Tip Project, I was reminded of my early days at working at the NLC and the consultations that pipeline were occurring. And it was machine-like. Um, and the agreements that underpin um, those projects, particularly between you know, land councils and companies, are machine-like in my view. They have certain things that they do. There are royalties that are negotiated. Um, there's usually a little clause saying that rangers need to be paid a certain amount to assist the hybrid economy. There's an employment clause for local, usually using the term best endeavours. Um, there's a clause supporting local business development. Um, and they are automated. And they are dusted off every couple of years. And they've been the same since the ranger agreement was negotiated in 1979. And um, I guess just picking up, Jane, what you were saying about this notion of good and bad development. I find it really interesting having worked at the yeah. NLC for sort of over a decade and I'm now doing PhD studies. Yeah, I don't think I was saying good and bad development. Well, I, I feel that there is almost that notion yeah. that big development, you know, gas plants, mines, they're bad, and that community driven yeah. development, such as ranger groups, small in scope, is good. But I think that there is where the cyborg metaphor kind of works for me is that it, all of those things are swept up in, a, in the same logic, um, I think to a certain extent, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I was more challenging the assumption of huge benefits that come out of a project, whereas mm. sometimes that can cause more disruption than you would. Mm. Sure, and look, I mean, I think there's lots of different, just to pick up, you know, there's lots of different policy solutions or alternatives that can be thrown out there too. I guess I'm mindful that I don't want to, you know, use or abuse my positions because I'm yeah. standing here to offer some sort of clever idea. I mean, my, my big question is how can Aboriginal people be more in the driver's seat of what they want and what benefits they get? Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, picking up on your point is they're often imposed from other parties. Yeah. I wonder if that's a resolvable thing sometimes, though, based on my, yeah, you know, all of our experience, pick yeah. <laughs> yeah. And does the modern corporation and how yeah. it operates even lend itself to that too? Because most corporations mean well. They don't come in um, trying to do the wrong thing, but they struggle with what does that look like. Mm -hmm. But they also mean well up to a point when it compromises their interests. Mm. Yeah. Just, to, just to put a little boundary in there, I agree with what you're saying, but it just yeah, no, 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 no. They only mean as well as their shareholders for it. I mean, there's a, there's a hierarchy of yeah. mm. interests and benefits. Mm. Um, look, I mean, I think a lot of this community investment stuff is really interesting, and like, you know, mm. that's my own opinion, and that it keeps things acquiescent and stable for the project to go ahead. Mm. And if things were really rowdy and crazy, yeah, it probably would increase it tenfold to keep things a bit more acquiescent. And if it wasn't, like, I think corporations can get away with that too. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.